The object that you're seeing on the screen right now is a visual model of the song All Star by Smash Mouth. This model similarly is for the song Don't Stop Believin' by Journey. And this substantially larger model is for the song Natural Science by Rush. I came up with these models myself as well as those for many other songs, and I used the periodic table of the elements to do it. So, I'm a drummer, and I play drums for my college's rock band, and I've been doing it for a few years, and it's pretty pretty fun. Um, we've been learning a lot of songs, um, but I'm also an art student, and I take a lot of classes, and I have not a lot of time in order to learn the songs that I have to play for rock band. So, I've had to find ways to sort of learn drum parts on the fly. Because it's important for drummers to know, like, when the verse starts, when the chorus starts, and how many times each of those happen above all else, because you don't want to get the rest of the band off track. So what I've taken to doing is I have an agenda book that I write all my assignments in, and I would flip to the back, and there's like a bunch of extra like places to put your classes in and stuff like that, and there's a bunch of grid spaces. And the system that I started coming up with was a system where every section of a song would get its own like little grid space and I would fill in each of the tiny little squares with any information that I needed to let me know how long to play this section for, how many measures, what uh, instruments to play there, whether that be the cymbals or the hi-hat, the snare drum, whatever notes I need in order to tell me what sounds to play at that part. And so when I'm listening to a song, my note taking sort of goes like this. Okay, so phrase number one is the first verse, and it is eight measures long. Okay, so that's like eight bars for the, I'm gonna call it the pre chorus. really sing. That's the chorus, that's the big part, and I play that for eight measures. And I'll keep doing this for the rest of the song, and it produces a very straightforward left to right sort of way of reading it, and then let's say I have another verse that comes in. What will happen is I'll put the second verse underneath the first verse on the next line, and then if another chorus happens in this song it does, then I'll put the second chorus under the first chorus and you read it left to right even if there's a gap in between. So what this does is it categorizes every single similar section, like verse, chorus, intro, whatever, into its own column. So they're all nice and organized. And that's basically what I do. Um, I can just look at it, I can just look down at it really quick and make sure I'm in the right spot and it makes like a little map for me to follow throughout the song. And then I just gotta know, like I just gotta memorize like what to play for each section, basically. Um, it really strips it down what I need to know in a short period of time. So somehow this wraps around to the periodic table. Haven't talked about that yet, so let's go talk about that. So we're not going to get too technical about the periodic table. Basically, it's set up like this. Each element has an atomic number, starting at hydrogen with number 1, helium with number 2, and so on all the way to 118 as of 2021. They're arranged from left to right, and each element in a column shares similar chemical properties, which repeat in a predictable pattern, hence why the table can be arranged into many rows instead of just being one long unbroken string of elements. Now if we look at the elements in the rightmost column, the next elements after each of these are of course back on the left hand side but I personally want to still have one long unbroken string of elements ordered by their atomic number, 
while also grouping them by their similar chemical properties. So, is there still a way to get the left and right columns to meet up? Well yes, there is, if you think in higher dimensions. It's just like if you had a two-dimensional map of the world that you wanted to turn into a globe, you need to push it out into three dimensions to make that happen. So, that's exactly what we'll do with the periodic table. We'll bend it to make the two end columns meet. And when we do that, this is what happens. And just like that, we've got our new shape to play with. It's not quite a nice, simple spiral or cylinder. It has these bulges and loops in it. And that's because the flat periodic table has some gaps in some of the rows. So to close those gaps and get those atomic numbers next to each other, we have to push the other elements outward to form loops. This shape has a name, actually. It's called Mendeleev's Flower, and it was created sometime around 1940. I think this is the coolest way of visualizing the periodic table. It's much more dynamic and interesting. If you think about it, every element that makes up the known universe has been condensed in a shape with a sense of flow and natural progression, as opposed to a rigid, flat chart. It's an organic shape, it makes it feel a bit more alive to me. And I think that's fitting, considering we're talking about an object that literally represents all of life, and the rest of existence, as we know it. When you have both of these concepts bouncing around in your head simultaneously with the periodic table and like the little cheat sheets, you just, I just started to notice natural similarities. It's like, I got grid over here, I have a grid over here, you read this one left to right, top to bottom, you read this one left to right, top to bottom, and at one point I was just like, what if I took my rock band cheat sheets and folded them in on themselves to make one unbroken path for the entire song just like I did with the periodic table. So what does that look like? Let's use everyone's favorite All-Star by Smash Mouth. This is the two-dimensional version, and when we wrap it into three dimensions, this is what it looks like. So this is it. This is the big concept right here. You can take any cheat sheet that I made for my rock band songs and loop them all on themselves and get these unbroken like little spiral coil things that honestly I think look kind of like unique proto-organisms in some sense. Kind of like how I talked about with the periodic table, how it has this like nice sort of organic shape. Every single song can potentially have its own organic shape as well, and you can compare them to each other. They might not be able to say that much on their own, but when you like compare a pop song with a really long like progressive rock song for example you can very easily see how a progressive rock song meanders over minutes and minutes of music playing you can really use this to like talk about how oh all pop songs sort of have the same structure and sound and this is a really good a visual example of that. You can just put like two or three of them right next to each other and be like, there it is. You can see it with your own eyes, just like that. Wait, hold on, just just a second. Let's not go writing off all pop music as the same like that. Um, I know I like my rock music, I especially like progressive rock, but there are a bunch of other songs in other genres, including rock music, that also are very similarly structured to that of a lot of pop songs. And we can unwrap this fairly easily. A lot of songs start off with some sort of theme or intro segment, then they go into the first verse, then the chorus, then the second verse, then typically the chorus again, then some sort of solo or musical break or bridge, whatever you want to call it, and then they'll do a third verse or the chorus one last time before ending in some sort of way. That's not specific to pop music at all. You can sort of intuitively feel this when listening to a lot of different genres, like maybe metal or rap or country music as well. But it's important to note, music genres like these are not the only ones to exist. And this might be where our model starts to break down a bit. For classical music, if you're dealing with something like a fugue, which has like the same idea repeated a lot of times, but it's always a little bit different each time, I don't know if the structure would hold up that well. And hey, as long as we're talking about the fluidity of genres like classical music, why not take into consideration the wide world of electronic music, or jazz, or pop music that's not just made mainly in these places in the world? Or really, any genre of music that's made anywhere in the world. 
The examples that I've used obviously only represent a small portion of the totality of music that's out there, and this model of visual representation may only strongly apply to a select few genres. It's a good incentive for me to broaden my musical horizons and study music from other cultures and places, because I'm really interested to see how far this concept can be pushed, and as a result, maybe it can lead to future discoveries and new ideas about ways to visualize the structure of music from anywhere and everywhere. Either way, for me, uh, this is something that I really enjoy, and uh, I'm just going to keep exploring this until I wake up one day surrounded by curly shapes all around me. This is going to be my life now. I'll let you know how it goes. Thank